welcome back to Sharon Cullen Art. Today I'm going to be doing a product review, which is why you see me in front of the camera and hopefully Diesel will stay quiet for me. So today my review is on two products. The first one is this travel brush by Rosemary and Company. I love using a mop brush when I'm out painting and plein air or doing urban sketching and such, but I hate to carry my mop brushes with me because I'm always afraid I'm going to ruin the, the brushes. So <clears throat> um, I finally found one online, which was Rosemary and Company. Diesel. And I remembered now why I have never bought it before, because I had read some poor reviews on this. So let me set this down. So anyway, this is the reason, well, this is the reason I wanted the brush. This is their medium point mop brush. And it is a very nice, nice brush. I really like the brush itself. It is 100% squirrel hair. The problem I have with this is that this slides right off. See, I can't even get it on there and keep it on there. So when I go to rinse a brush, if I wiggle it around enough, now it's not gonna do it, but if I, whoops, if I wiggle it around enough, then it comes right off, just like that. They are so loose, and other people have complained about them being loose before. So now, if any of you guys have any ideas on how I can make this better, let me know. I was thinking of maybe putting a little glue that's sticky, you know, just my regular stick Elmer's glue or something that will wear off over time. If I put that on there, it might make it sticky. But if I go to rinse things off roughly in the water to try to get my paint off, I'm afraid I'm gonna lose my brush. And then the other problem I have with it is that there's no hole in the end of it. Like silver brushes, they're black velvet line. I think they call it Voyage. They have travel brushes and in the tip, there's a hole and that hole allows your brush to dry out between uses. Now, I wet this brush last night and it's still very damp because I put it in here. Now, you can't really let them dry out and then put them away or you run the risk of plying your, splaying your brush apart on the um, bristles and I don't want that to happen. So, this is not real tight either, but it is tighter. So I can tolerate that. Now, if it was like that on the other side, it'd be great. I thought about pinching it, but then I thought, well, if I wanted to ever return it, I can't because I've ruined the brush. So I'm not sure what I'm gonna do. If any of you own this brush and have this problem, please comment below. Let us know what you did, if you returned it, if you found a way to fix it yourself or what, because I really like this brush and I have not found another Squirrel Mop travel brush anywhere. So. That was my first item. <clears throat> the next item I'm going to review is a book. And this book is by Stephanie Bauer. It's one of the Urban Sketching Handbooks. It just came out on November 5th. It is 101 Sketching Tips. The funny thing is, is that I heard somebody or I read somewhere about this book. Uh, I think I may have seen it in a magazine my watercolor artist magazine that I get on the Zinio app, I read about this book that I could pre-order. So I quickly went over to Amazon thinking, I've got to get this book. I got to get it. So I go on Amazon, go to order it. I click to order and it says right at the top, you purchased this item in July. <laughs> I pre-ordered this book in July. It's been so long that I forgot that I even ordered the book. And so I was very happy when it came on the 5th. It was like a little mini birthday gift to myself. And let me tell you, this has a plethora of great tips in it. Some of the tips to me, I felt were kind of filler tips. Although if you're an absolute beginner, you would appreciate this book a lot because there are tips that go right from the beginning all the way through. And this is what the book looks like. You can see the pictures on the front and on the back. There are 47 contributing artists to this book. So these are not all of Stephanie's sketches. You're gonna get 47 other artists' sketches along with some of hers. And that's kind of nice because if you want a book with a variety of different sketching styles, then you have access to it in this book. The other thing is, is as like 
all of the Urban Sketching handbooks. They are nice and small. I believe they're about five by eight, the same size as the standard sketchbook. And they have the rubber uh, band that goes over the pages so your book won't fall open inside your bag. And you can carry it with you wherever you go. Now, Stephanie Bauer is, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about her. She is an artist, urban sketcher, illustrator, and architect. She wrote one of the other urban sketching books called On Perspective, which is another excellent book that I would recommend buying if you want to understand perspective and how to draw landscapes and things like that. It is a very useful book to have. I own that one and I own four others. One of them I have on Kindle and then I have four of these now in the soft cover paperback um, books. But she Stephanie worked as a licensed architect in New York City before gravitating to professional architectural illustration and concept design. In Seattle, she produces pencil and watercolor images for many renowned architecture and design firms. She was twice honored with the K. Robb Architectural Delineation Award for Best Travel Sketch and was the 2013 Gabriel Prize Architecture Fellowship recipient. So that's a little bit about her. She's also um, taught at Parsons in New York City, which is a renowned art school. Also in the Seattle, at, in Seattle at the University of Washington and also the Cornish College of the Arts. She's done several of the classes at the Urban Sketcher Symposiums that are every, once a year. Uh, so you'll see you you'll see a lot of her there, um, but anyway, let me get on to the book itself. This book has has been separated into eight chapters. Uh, the first one is on your market set go. Then it all starts with a good line talking about lines and how we draw the value of tone, compelling compositions, good bones. It's all about your eye level, which gets into perspective a bit. Towers are like wedding cakes. And then come on, come on in, the water is fine. And that's about water. And then there, at the back of the book are challenges, which is really nice. So once you read through this book, which is a quick read, it really is. I've read through it once, and then I went through it first just by looking at the titles of the actual tips. But there are 20 challenges in the back of the book here, as you can see which are really nice. And then at the back, they show all the contributing artists. Um, several of them you would know right offhand if you follow Urban Sketchers at all. The, a big one is Paul Heaston. He's an amazing fisheye kind of lens drawer, which is, he does amazing work. I'll show you one of his photos in here. Then there's Sherry Blaukoff. There's Gabriel Campanario. Um, let's see some other ones that you might recognize. Nice. Uh, this one is an Indian name I have trouble saying. Sahita Shiradkar. And I follow that one on, uh, I follow all of these actually on Instagram, so you can find these people there. But there are 47 of them. I'm not gonna list all of their names. Now to get into the book itself, some of them, like I said, are very simple tips. Um, that most of us would already know. There's always a little blurb in the front of the chapter to get you going. And then she starts with her bullet point tips. Each one, each tip is in bold print. And then she tells you all about that tip. I was trying to think of the wor a word I was going to say. I totally lost it. Oh my gosh. The first one, draw and paint on location if you can. That is a biggie. If you want to get into urban sketching, you need to go out in urban sketch. I'm going to get back out there, uh, especially after the first of the year, uh, after my husband's retired and he can take over a lot of the stuff here at home, then I can get out and do a lot more urban sketching. The biggest problem for me, and I apologize for my dog, the biggest problem I have is filming my urban sketching. Unless you have a cameraman that helps you and does your filming for you, somebody like James Gurney has his own cameraman that 
follows him around and catches all the different angles and over the shoulder and everything. It, that makes it a lot easier. But for me, I'm trying to do it all myself, which means I have to start and stop and start and stop. And, and an urban sketch can take me a couple hours at that rate. And I just don't have it in me all the time. So I will try to do some of that, but it's not going to be to the quality that you see others with because I don't make money on YouTube and I'm just me, little old me. So um, the next thing is travel right. Travel light. She tells you to, what to pack in your sketch bag. Start small. She says, new to sketching, start small. It's much less intimidating to fill a small piece of paper and you won't get sidetracked drawing too much detail. Try a small pocket size sketchbook that you can carry with you. So you are ready the moment inspiration strikes. And this is probably a, a three and a half by five. This is a portrait style. You can also get them landscape style that go this way. Um, but I prefer landscape style. You can make it wider across the page if you've got more area to fill or whatever. But she recommends this. Um, and then also starting with the simple subject. You don't have to get a full landscape. Narrow it down a little bit. Like on this one, uh, Sue Heston did a railroad crossing. It was actually an 8 by 11 inch sketch, but she only drew a couple train cars and a railroad crossing, which keeps your, your focus real small. Um, and I apologize if I'm looking in the wrong spot. My previous camera, the lens was at the top of my camera and now it's down in the middle. So I forget to look and I can't see it because I'm facing my window and it snowed and it's white outside. So I'm getting the light in my eyes, which is really hard. Okay, then she goes on to uh, telling yourself to treat yourself to a beautiful sketching tool. To me, that's unnecessary to put in the book. And she also says, draw a lot. Daily drawing, I feel, is key. I haven't been able to do it daily because there's always something going on. Um, my son's birthdays were on the 5th of November, the day this book came out, and mine is on the 9th of November, so we always celebrate together. They're all coming up this weekend, and I won't get any painting done or anything, so that makes it more difficult. But she says to draw a lot, and then she says in her next tip, the more you draw, the more you'll figure out for next time. And she talks about embracing your audience. If you're afraid to get out there and do some urban sketching, she suggests just do it anyway because most of these people don't know how to draw. They have no clue, and they're going to be amazed that you're out there doing it at all. So uh, she also says draw where you are. If you're not out urban sketching, draw your kitchen or something like that. And here is a picture of a kitchen. This one was drawn by Josiah Hanchett from the U.S., that is really a cool sketch, too. I love it. Um, here's a good one. <clears throat> Don't wait to start until you're good enough. Getting out there in urban sketching, you should be doing right away. Don't wait till you're good enough. I didn't wait till I was good enough. And, and it made it, uh, made it a lot better for me because... Uh, when I started, I would sketch in my car. That way I didn't have to worry about somebody looking over my shoulder. Another thing that you can do, and she doesn't say any of these things in her book, which I think are really good tips, set yourself up against a wall. If you're doing a storefront across the street, then push yourself up against the wall so that people can't come up from behind you to, to watch you sketch. That makes it a lot easier. Uh, you'll see them coming at you. Uh, another thing, don't try to find your style. This one was really good. She says, beginning sketchers often try different sketching styles, like trying on different shoes to buy. While it's good to walk in another artist's shoes a bit and experiment and sketch, don't think too much about what others do. Just do what you do naturally. Your hand is already unique, and the way you see the world is yours alone. The truth is, you already have a style. It will develop, improve, and emerge more cl clearly over time. And that's what just hap what happened for me. I was worried about the same things, and I used to follow tutorial after tutorial after tutorial. Tutorials are great. Um, I do them myself on my channel, and they're great. But I say, 
watch an entire tutorial, take notes on what you need to do, remember the key points about how you do your sky, how you do this or that, and then do it yourself or find a totally different, unique scene to paint. And you'll find your style emerging a lot more easily than trying to follow exactly how another painter paints. I paint differently than everyone else. And it took me a few years and my style is still emerging and it will, it will change shape and whatever over time as you continue to excel in your craft. So just let it go and don't worry about that. Uh, so then the next chapter was all about, it all starts with a good line. And this is about how to experiment with different tools, how to draw clean lines, um, drawing long straight lines and segments, how she says you should and shouldn't do things. She puts an X for the wrong way, a check mark for the right way on how to draw lines. And then the vocabulary of line weights. How you, when, you, when you use a light line weight, a medium line weight, and a heavy line weight. So here's the Paul Heaston sketch I wanted to show you. Many of you are probably familiar with him. He's, done, he's got many online tutorials that you can follow. Um, Craftsy.com, C-R-A-F-T-S-Y.com. I think it's .com, maybe it's .org. But anyway, Craftsy that he has classes there on sketching that are excellent. She talks about drawing lines with energy, with speed, when you should use wiggly lines or wonky lines. Some wiggling in your lines gives your art that extra pizzazz that it needs, you know? I just think it makes your sketches look better if things aren't perfect. And she gets into hash marks and how to do the different hash marks and when you should use those hash marks. Okay, the next part is about compelling compositions. Now, this is something I wanted to talk to you all about in another video, but I'm going to mention it here. A few months back, there was somebody who went off on me here on YouTube. She blew me away telling me that my composition was a bad composition because I didn't use the rule of thirds. And I told her that there are multiple ways to do a composition. You don't want to always do something with the rule of thirds, and I'll get into that in just a second, because we'd all have the same looking compositions. Our focus would either be up here in this corner, down here in this corner, over here in this corner, up here in this corner, and it would drive me bonky. But there are several different types of compositions. The first one she talks in about is a symmetry composition. That's when something is in the middle, and that's great for architecture. When you're going to draw a building and that's your focal point, you may want that in the center of your drawing or a portrait, for instance. Um, then there's the asymmetry, where your focal point is off-center and you kind of tilt your, your perspective, like if this was flat, then you might tilt it this way with something back here or something up here. She shows a picture of it right here, tilting that. Um, then there's the rule of thirds, and this is the rule of thirds where you, where you split everything into thirds vertically and horizontally, and then this is where you would set your focal point in one of these four spots. That is the most common form of where you place your, your focal point in a composition. It always gives you a good composition when you use that, which is why most people go with that because it's a surefire way of making a good composition. The others take a little more skill. Then there's the golden ratio or section composition. This one's a little bit trickier. This one is, you'll see a lot in nature, which is what I used when the girl went off on me. I was doing the golden ratio. Um, it's abundant in nature. This is a classical system of proportioning used by ancient Greeks that is remarkably harmonious to our senses. The ratio is approximately 1 to 1 1.6. So one unit high or wide and a little more than one and a half units wide or tall. Um, in a 5 by 8 sketchbook, you already have just about the perfect golden ratio. And that's how it would look. Something like this right here. Then the last one, she talks about our squares. A square-shaped composition. I don't think I've ever used this one. 
allows you to compose interesting two-dimensional shapes using the negative and the positive spaces of the page. And she talks about that right down here and shows a, an example of it. So those are the five different composition styles that she goes over. So don't think that the rule of thirds is your only way to compose a good painting. It's not, or sketch. Um, there's beautiful sketches in here, lots and lots of pictures. And she goes into the different styles of focal points. Now here's one of the focal points that's on an angle, the asymmetry. Here's one that's centered, that's symmetry. This one I would say is more classic. Ah, here's another one in asymmetry using the whole page. She recommends thumbnail sketches, which is basically doing a value sketch before you do your painting. The next one is good bones. Edit what you see to simple shapes. That's a big key, and that's something that I'm always working on, trying to keep my shapes simple and then going in and painting in the rest. Using your pencil or pen as a measuring stick. Now this is something that I use a lot when I'm out in the field, using my pen or pencil as a, uh, as a measuring stick. But don't keep it up to your face. Always stretch your arm out fully and hold your pencil up because when you do that, you're always holding your pencil at the same point, the same length from your eyes, no matter where you're putting it at. Know your view options being upper, looking down, looking up, you know, that kind of thing, finding your horizon lines. The next chapter, it's all about your eye level, and she goes into drawing things from different angles. She says to think eye level, not horizon line, because it makes it easier for you to get your sketch down on the paper. Lines appear flatter the closer they are to your eye level. Then what she's talking about is that when you're looking up at something, they start to curve in this direction. When you're looking down at something, they tend to curve in this direction. And she goes into that with cylinders somewhere. I'm trying to find that. I don't see it. It must have been in a different area. Your eye level is probably lower than you think it is. The average is at about five feet. And she talks about an easy way to do chairs using the box method, which is genius. That way your chairs aren't all wonky. Then she gets into towers are like wedding cakes and other aha moments. And she talks about drawing how to draw arches in your, like if you're going into a beautiful cathedral or something like that. Um, and also to not make your lines cut off. Like if you're drawing a tower, don't do it like this where you're making your line straight and then it just cuts off. You want to bring it around like this. So she tells you how to do that. Oh, here's the spot I was talking about where it shows the curve below and the curve above depending on where your eye line is. Uh, so she's got lots of stuff in here that are just genius, I thought. Stairs are like wet wedges of cheese and she talks about how to do stairs. I struggled with stairs for a long time and it never occurred to me that when you put your eye line in on your steps, you're going to change the way the upper steps are seen from the lower steps because you're seeing a different view. The lower steps, you're actually seeing the top of the step. But on the upper steps, you're just seeing the lift of the step and then there's a line. You don't see the top of that step. And at eye level, is right where it's, it shifts from one to the other. So it goes on from there about the drawing like the wedding cake, how to draw cars starting with box shapes, how to draw trees, how she uses the umbrella method for drawing trees. That doesn't mean that each of your trees is like an umbrella because every tree has a different shape. She's talking more about the light and shadow. She talks in here somewhere about um, light, shadow, and shade, how shade and shadow are different. And I never really thought about it, but it's true. You can have a portion of a building that's 
in the shade a portion of your building that's in sunlight. So you've got shade and sunlight, and then you have your cast shadow from the side of the building. So shade and shadow are different. She gets into watercolor and using watercolor. Now this is kind of where she loses me a little bit. Things like watercolor works light to dark. We know that as watercolorists, you already know that. Now, if you're a beginner, you may not know that. If you're an oil painter, you may not realize that. Or an, or an acrylic painter, you may not realize that because they usually go from dark to light, layering on top of each other. But for us, it's light to dark. You don't want to lose your lights because then you can't go back and put a transparent light over a transparent dark. You're just going to end up with mud. You can always go in with gouache, though, if you mess up. Using limited color palettes which I think is a good thing. And I'm gonna start doing some of my paintings with very limited color palettes, maybe taking three to six colors out and that's it because I tend to use bigger palettes that have 13 or more uh, colors in them just because I like to have a variety. Using one color to make a strong statement. She talks about that and here's an example of it. She just uses red in this one. She just uses yellow in this one. And then the rest is shading. So that's some of what's in this book. Oh, here's the shade versus shadow in color. And you can see what she's talking about here. This is sun, this is shade, and then this is shadow. And then this part she's talking about the reflected light that can come in right there. But great book, you guys. And that was just, just a few of the many, many different types of tips she has in here, using different hues to show depth, considering big contrasts for big impact, using bright colors to show a lot of activity. I tend to be a bright color painter. I don't like my colors washed out. Uh, some people use watercolor and it's so pale. To me, it's like, why bother? That's just my, my personal thing. But she does say something in here about watercolor and when how when you're using watercolor let me find that number 84 for paint consistency think of dairy products i think lindsay Wirick over on the frugal crafter uses that to explain her consistency of paint when she's doing a tutorial she'll say thickness of milk thickness of cream thickness of skim a lot of people will paint only in skim milk and they have no value change in their, in their painting, which is kind of a bummer. And she explains it as skim milk, 2% whole milk and cream. Watercolor is like stained glass. It has to be transparent enough that light can pass through it. Hit the white of the paper and bounce back to your eye for that glorious glow. If you're not getting that, you're probably using too much paint. When I first started painting, I tended to paint a little bit on the heavy-handed side, more of a cream-like consistency, and I wasn't getting that bouncing back of light. So my paintings look sort of flat. Then I finally realized that it was better for me to glaze doing a layer of skim and then a little more and a little more. The time that you're going to use that cream consistency is more in your finishing lines and your finishing work where you're just dabbing it here and there where you want it that extra value. It says, for this reason, too much pigment in your mix will block the bouncing of light. Too little pigment will leave you with an unsatisfying, literally washed out lack of color. Getting a good ratio of paint to water is key. Try thinking of paint consistency as familiar as dairy products ranging from very watery skim milk to heavy cream. You'll start with lots of skim milk that covers most of your paper and you'll end with little bits of the thickest cream that provide contrast and pop in your painting, like I just said. That's a little bit about this book. I hope you enjoyed the review. Let me know down below and go out and get yourself a copy of this. This is really good. You can get it on Amazon. I think it's about $11, maybe $12. And if you want it on Kindle, it's a little bit more, $14 or $17 to get it on Kindle. So everybody, remember, be courageous, paint with wild abandon, and most of all, be kind to each other. And if you're waiting on another uh, art studio building vlog, I will be doing one next week when they come and do the framing. Right now, I don't have enough for a full vlog. Somebody also asked me about the building vlog on the house and the... Um, 
uh, showing us an update on that. But I still don't have my railing done. A lot of this is going to be waiting until after the holidays once my husband is retired and then we can really start pounding stuff out and then I'll be able to show you more. We haven't finished the basement yet. That's still just cinder block down there. So there's a lot to do, but there will be more of that coming on and then I'll do a final tour, but it's gonna be next year. The art studio on the other hand will be my next vlog that I do. So have a great day everybody. Bye-bye.